Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is poet Julia Kolchinsky Dasbach, author of The Many Names of Mother, selected by Ellen Bass as the winner of the 2018 Stan and Tom Wick Poetry Prize. Her second collection, Don't Touch the Bones, won the 2019 Idaho Poetry Prize. Her third collection, 40 Weeks, is forthcoming in 2022. Dasbach earned an MFA in poetry from the University of Oregon's creative writing program in 2013 and a PhD in comparative literature and literary theory from the University of Pennsylvania. She is a Murphy Visiting Fellow in Poetry at Hendricks College. On January 26, 2022, Dasbach will give a virtual reading as a guest of the University of Oregon's creative writing program. Thanks, Julia, for coming on the show. It's just a pleasure to have you. I'm so excited to be here. So central to your poetry is your personal history and your family history. Tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, so I immigrated from um, Dnieper, Ukraine, um, Dnipro, um, as it's called now. It used to be Dnipropetrovsk, now it's uh, Dnipro, um, when I was six years old. Um, and uh, I immigrated with my family. We came as Jewish refugees. And so um, I grew up um, in a DC metro area suburb of Rockville, Maryland. And I grew up raised by my um, great grandmother who um, you know, didn't often talk about her past, but I grew up hearing a lot of Yiddish and knowing very much that we were Jews without um, knowing what that really meant. Because in the former Soviet Union, being Jewish was forbidden. You couldn't practice religion. Um, but at the same time, there was a lot of cultural heritage. There was a lot of cultural celebrating of holidays, even though it was forbidden to do so religiously. Um, so I grew up with a lot of this kind of history hovering around me. Um, and as I got um, older, I, you know, began investigating it. Um, and when, when I was um, 16, um, my great grandmother um, moved in to live with us. Um, well, she lived with us when I was young, but when she um, got older and was suffering dementia and Alzheimer's, um, we took care of her and she lived with us for a while. She started to um, see visions of a Nazi who had come back to life and was after her. And so she began to reenact a lot of her past. And it was at that point that I kind of started to discover a lot of um, the Holocaust history um, that my family never talked about. Um, and since then I had, you know, have been fascinated with it, haunted um, by it and um, been researching it, writing about it, and um, traveling both um, you know, for personal and academic scholarship in order to investigate um, this history that I come from um, and to write, to figure out um, what, it, what it all means. So I have two related questions. The first is how did you come to be a poet? And also how did you come to commit your poetry to exploring this history? You know, I think uh, none of us kind of come to be writers. It's an impulse um, that we have to do it. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't know if it's ever a choice. It's just, that's the way I figure things out is I have to write about it to understand what I think about something. Um, and um, I, I um, repeat the other part of your question again, so I can return to it. Why is poetry the medium that you use to explore this this personal history, this political history? What is it about poetry as you practice it that makes that the right medium to do this work? I mean, there are plenty of people that study the history of the Holocaust and study the history of Soviet Jewry, but they don't write poems about it. Absolutely. So for me growing up, you know, in a Russian speaking household, I grew up with Russian language poets, right? I grew up listening to 
Pushkin and to Akhmatova and Mandelstam. And I grew up with this music in my ears. You know, I was taught to memorize and recite poems. So at first it was the natural language in which I spoke and wrote. Um, and even when I, you know, write in English, I often write with a kind of, especially when I write about my a familial history, which is a lot of what I write about, it has a kind of, I don't know, often Slavic kind of cadence to it at times. Um, um, but I, I think too, from studying poetry and from studying craft, um, it has the potential to bridge temporalities in a way that other genres do not. And in my you know, doctoral work on what I've termed lyric witness, the reason that I believe poets writing about this kind of ancestral atrocity turn to poetry and specifically to the lyric, right? To poetry about a moment that then expands across temporalities is that poetry enables you to do this. It enables you to reach beyond, from within one moment, it enables you to reach into a past and then towards a future um, and to bridge temporalities. And it also blends voices, right? That lyric I, that first person speaker that you're using, um, is at once the self, but also beyond the self. It can be a persona. It can be the voice of my great grandmother. It can expand into a voice of someone I do not know. Of course, there are many ethical questions at, at stake there and it has to be handled very deftly. Um, but there's just a lot of, you know, potential within poetry. And I think too, for me, poetry, when you see a poem on the page, you instantly know you are within a crafted space, right? So you are not staking claim to a historical truth. When you are entering a poem, I am not telling you that, yes, this is exactly what happened. What I am staking claim to is an emotional truth to the truth of the experience. Um, not that this is exactly what happened to my great grandmother because I can never know that because I have scoured archival records and I have still not found you know, the name of my great grandfather uh, who we do not know how he died. You know? um, but I am staking claim to something else. And I think the poem gives us the ability to do that. Um, and so I really, really cling to that. And I think that's why I've written so much in the genre of poetry. Um, and now I have written quite a bit of um, creative nonfiction. And the nonfiction that I've been writing has been much more about my present experience of motherhood and a lot less about my ancestral, you know, um, and ancestry. Um, because I think that in my, you know, present experience of motherhood, I have much more agency to write in the prose, in the creative nonfiction. I have a lot more, you know, claim um, in that space. Yeah. Really, really interesting um, explanation and, and thought provoking. At this point, um, can I ask you to read a poem? Sure. Um, I'm trying to think. <laughs> I, I feel like... Um, I'm trying to think of which poem is best to kind of engage all the things that we've um, just talked about. Um, and I wonder, um, maybe let's, let's start with one of the other women don't tell you poems in the book. Um, so in my first book, The Many Names for Mother, I wrote a lot of other women don't tell you poems because there's just so much that other women don't tell you about the experience of motherhood and pregnancy and just all of this stuff. So I wrote one and then I just couldn't stop writing them. Um, and so I'm gonna um, read the one about um, giving birth to my son and um, having my mother in the delivery room with me. Um, and of course, with all of the, um, 
with all of my sticky tabs in my book. Why is it not coming up? Where are you? This particular other women don't tell you poem. There you are. <clears throat> Other women don't tell you what your mother will say just after he is born. After they slap him onto your stomach like a wet rag, the tether binding you still warm and pulsing. And just as you look down expecting blood, they don't tell you sometimes it isn't there. The flesh almost clean, dark, moss of hair covered by a thin white film, a second skin, a part of you still holding on to him, perhaps. He looks like an alien, she exclaimed, giddy with becoming. But they tell her she's too young to be a grandmother and she is happier for it. Are his ears going to stay like this? As if she'd never given birth herself, though she reminded you she has just hours earlier, your belly rising like a moving mountain as she recalled how back in the old country she was stitched up with nothing for the pain. The young male nurse responded to her screams does it really hurt that bad? And other women tell you that it does, that it's unbearable, but you will bear it, that it's a mountain and drowning, that it's all worth it in the end. They don't tell you when the pain really comes, when it moves through you, a rush of snow melt, boring boulders on the side of the road and everyone stopping to look, that a small part of you will love the feeling, the control to grind as though you were chewing stones, the want to bear the way centuries have, bare and unbroken by the bearing. Like the women who didn't tell you any of this, your grandmother and hers holding each other, hands and boiling water and sopping towels and feeling everything only to never speak about their pain, to continue having girls, to raise them so they know to let their mothers be a part of everything, to understand your mother when she reminds you that you are an only child because your tiny body hurt her bad enough to never want me. Thank you so much for that. Um, be, just before you read, you mentioned that when a reader enters the poem, they know that it's a crafted space. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in, um, what, you know, I was struck by your varied approach to poetic form. Mm -hmm. Some of the poems are written in particular poetic forms, the Pantoon, the Ghazal. Others are characterized by notable visual qualities like internal white space, stanzas patterned in, in distinctive ways. Tell us about your approach to poetic form, how you think about it in relation to the stories that you tell in your verse. Yeah, so I mean, I think my studies at Oregon, you know, really influenced me, especially Garrett Hongo's um, <laughs> genres and forms seminars. Um, and it's there where I really began to think about how when we tell stories of trauma, um, we almost turn to form as a way to try to order the chaos in a way. And almost in a contradictory way, rather than these forms being a way of giving an expected narrative or an expected lyric, they do the unexpected. So rather than a villanelle, doing what is expected in, of a Holocaust narrative. It does the opposite, in fact. It turns it on its head. And so in my, then in my studies of you know, trauma theory at Penn, um, I started to theorize that poets actually turn to form in order to subvert our expectations of Holocaust narrative. 
Um, and so I started to try to do that in my writing where I think I was doing it all along. And then I started to almost kind of read into what I was doing all along because I was writing uh, villanelles in my MFA work. And these villanelles were about the Holocaust um, all along. Um, so, um, and, and, and then I, you know, knew and read other poets who were doing it way before me. Um, so it's not like I in any way invented the wheel, but um, yeah, so, so I think there, there's, there's something to it. There, there's something to these forms, these, these echoes that happen in the refrains um, where the potentials shift. Um, and I think sim similarly about the white space. So there's a poem in my um, second collection called Archive, where I use some archival footage um, where my great grandfather's name is missing in the archive. And I show that and I put it in there. Um, and then the, the poem itself, you know, reads in two sides and it almost puts the reader in a kind of perpetrator, bystander, witness, in a challenging perspective where they must choose the way they read the poem. There's just a complicated relationship to the page. There's not necessarily one way of reading the poem. And I don't want there necessarily to be one way of reading it. Um, so I just want to challenge, I guess, the way that the reader engages with the piece um, and with the space, right? With the crafted space. I want to challenge truth and, you know, the, what we think we know about the Holocaust narrative. Um, I want to challenge this notion that, oh, you're still writing about the Holocaust? When I would say, what my dissertation is about, that it's about contemporary poetry about the Holocaust, the common refrain I would get is people are still writing about that? I'm like, oh, that's, wasn't that a long time ago? N no, no, it really wasn't a long time ago. And when it comes to the Holocaust in the Soviet Union, there is so much we still don't know. Um, it is a narrative very much unlike the concentration camp narrative that, is much more documented, but there is, of course, still so much more research to be done. And, you know, the notion that once a story has been told, well, we don't need to tell it again, is, of course, um, very uh, problematic, to say the least, uh, especially when it comes to uh, trauma. So, um, so I think, again, form is, 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 is a tool. Um, and then, and then, just one other little thing about form is that, you know, to go back to Adorno's kind of infamous quote of, it is barbaric to write poetry after Auschwitz, that tons of poets and scholars have responded to. And, you know, it was, it was very much a response to Paul Salon um, and his, his use of language and, uh, you know, use of the Ger Germanic language, right? The language of the barbarian to continue to write poetry. It's also a response to form. It's the fact that form had betrayed us, right? These Goethe and all of the poets who should have, who should have rescued us didn't. Um, but in fact, continuing to write in form um, shows us hope rather than the opposite. Shows us that we can continue to exist after atrocity. Um, not that we can't. And Adorno himself responded to his own claim and said that that's not what he meant. So I'm not gonna go into all of that, but um, I just wanna point out that that's also part of the reason why um, I turn to these forms um, and many other poets writing about the Holocaust um, do so as well, yeah. So can I ask you to read another poem now? Yes, um, now I feel like I have to read the Holocaust because I'll, um, <laughs> because it just, it just feels very pressing um, because it comes from um, a, very, a very true uh, quote that someone uh, said to me. Um, 
So this is Kazal refusing to name the Holocaust. Um, and it was written um, after the October 27th, um, 2018 shooting um, at the Tree of Life uh, Synagogue um, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And um, the one thing to know about this poem is, and it, it's in the poem, but just to clarify, if you'll recall, um, one of the victims was initially misnamed as a Holocaust survivor in the news. And then this, there was a big hullabaloo about it. Um, and that infuriated me and inspired me to write. Um, in addition to, you know, my own gr grieving and processing. Um, <clears throat> Your poetry is so much more relevant now that the Holocaust is back in fashion, someone said. Because without the Holocaust, do we not know how to die, to grieve, to lose, to hold each other against shaking trees, to feel connected by more than the whole cost of our senseless constant dying? My babushka would never tell the story of her husband shot at Babi Yar as Holocaust, would scream about a Nazi's hands around her neck, his hands under her skirt, his hands, his hands. She would relive the whole accost of him and never name herself survivor. When Rose was named eldest among the dead, did the trees not burn, tear out their roots? holy cost of dying. When she was named survivor, did you not shake and weep the same as when they told you she had not survived the Holocaust? Did you not cling to someone's trunk so hard that it became a body you could lose, your own arms branching wholly, costing you to fall uprooted so say their names, Melvin, Irving, Jerry, Cecil, David, Daniel, Bernice, Sylvan, Joyce, Richard, and Rose. Don't simply name them Holocaust. Thank you for that. Will you say a little bit why you chose the uh, poetic form of Ghazal for this poem? Um, well, I think part of the reason is um, because I, I love its insistence. I love that it insists on um, repeating, you know, the same word at the end of each couplet. Um, I also, you know, the, the shooting was um, not only an assault against Jews, it was an assault against Hyas, um, which was the organization that brought my family um, to the United States. Um, and it is an organization that initially, you know, was bringing um, Jewish refugees, but has since brought refugees from all over. And a lot of refugees from Islamic countries as well. And the Hazal is an Arabic form. Um, and so I was, it, it was also a political choice to use a form that is, you know, interfaith. It is multi-ethnic. It is a form that is hybrid, right? That is trans, transcultural, right? Or that is trying to bridge things. Um, that, is, that is trying to bridge a divide. And in doing that, I'm actually breaking the word Holocaust as I'm doing it. I'm breaking and using holocaust, you know, holy cost and things like that. Um, so while the form is trying to be a bridge, I'm breaking up the word that is insistently being repeated to try and question what it means that we keep clinging to this thing as being the thing that unites the Jewish people when we should be united by so much more than that. Um, and, um, after this atrocity happened, actually, uh, a, a poet in Philadelphia, um, Olga Lifshin, um, who's also 
an immigrant from uh, the former Soviet Union, also brought over by Hayes, um, we formed a, a reading series called From Across the Waters and put together a bunch of readings. First, strictly, uh, you know, by refugees and then it grew. And so then we just had voices for refugees and we, you know, it was, it was we just got together. We even had a reading that was just impromptu uh, when, you know, the, uh, I, I can't even remember which of the travel bands had come out, but we, you know, we impromptu all got together in front of the Philadelphia Free Library and we're just reading poems through a loudspeaker. And uh, my daughter was two months old <laughs> and I was wearing her reading poems through a loudspeaker. It was one of um, a, a highlight moment in my poetic career was wearing my two months old daughter reading poems from a loudspeaker uh, in support of people coming to this country uh, and getting to create and, um, you know, be be together and have their voices heard, um, and I, you know, I that that's that's the reason my family came was so that I could have this voice, was so that I I could get to do this. You know, I I I don't think they ever could have imagined that this is what I would be doing. Never could have imagined. I don't think you know I. Jewish immigrants who come want their kids to grow up to be engineers and doctors and lawyers and you know, uh, and then they they get stuck with poets. But of course, we're raised on poetry. So even though we're raised on poetry, we're supposed to grow up to be you know the doctors and lawyers of the world. Um, yeah. <laughs> so so you describe yourself as a poet. You're clearly a poet. Um, you have an MFA from the University of Oregon, but you also have a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. That is no small feat. They're, I, you know, they imagine that their children are going to be engineers. They don't think they're going to be MFA PhDs. So just <laughs> say a little bit about, and you've already talked about lyrical witness, yeah. but say a little bit about how you understand the scholarly side of what you've done and the poetic side of what you've done, the relationship between those two aspects of your accomplishments. Well, I mean, I think they're very interconnected. Um, so when I when I first got to Penn, I thought that I was going to be studying um, Russian literature. I thought I thought that I could do it. I thought that I was going to leave my love of American poetry for a while, and I was going to study Russian literature. And um, even though I adored my um, amazing uh, professor Kevin Platt, and he was my dissertation director along with Paul Saint Amour, who are I just they're Menches of beyond uh, any other sorts. Um, I I had to confess that the Russian side was going to be a big part of my dissertation, but I needed to go back to um, contemporary American poetry with a big Russian backbone. You know, so I wanted to focus on those writers who were maybe of kind of Russian descent, um, um, and um, I, from the beginning, knew that I wanted my dissertation to be um, a challenge to what a dissertation should look like. I really struggled with what critical writing looked like and with, um, with its forms, with the rigidity of its form. I wanted argument to look different. I wanted argument to have more lyric in it. I wanted it to have more music and more play um, and more poetry within the way that you can argue. Uh, and you know, you said that you know Paul Saint Amour and you know that he is a very lyrical writer. Um, and so he really supported that venture. Um, uh, and so my dissertation is quite hybrid um, and it has pieces of nonfiction, it has poetry in it. Um, and it's actually each chapter is structured in, um, in the form of the material that it analyzes. So my opening chapter on the sonnet is structured like a sonnet. It has 14 sections and each title of each section is a line of a sonnet. And when you put them together, they build a sonnet. Um, and then, uh, you know, you'll have to read the dissertation to figure it out. And maybe one day it'll be a book. 
Um, but I think that's kind of where my scholarship really went in addition to you know, uh, researching um, the way that contemporary poetry is engaging with the topics of the Holocaust and specifically the, the case of um, atrocity in former Soviet territories. It really looked at what we can do to scholarly writing um, and how we can challenge it. Um, fascinating, fascinating. I, I really do want to read it. I do hope you publish it. Um, Julia, we're, we're a little bit over time, but I, I, uh, I'm compelled to ask you to uh, finish up by reading one more poem for us. Um, okay, well, let's end on a light note. Let's, let's end um, with um, In Everything He Finds the Moon because um, I write a lot of heavy poems um, and in, in every heaviness we need light and um, the light is always my children. And the most wonderful thing about becoming um, a mom for me has been watching my children make sense of the world. And the way they make sense of it is just so beautiful. They make natural metaphors. They just, the way they see the world is through metaphor. Um, so this poem is just, you know, kind of stolen from my son from watching him make sense of the world um, and compare one thing to another. That's just how children make sense of it. In everything he finds the moon. Yuna, he calls, pointing up and drawing out the U. The Russian L, still too hard to form Luna. We understand, make meaning out of what it's left us. Yuna, on the shoulder of my shirt, where his sleeping mouth's wet outline left imperfect waning. Yuna in the fabric covering my belly where his finger found a hole through which skin shone like moonlight. Yuna on the wings of every moth or butterfly. Yuna, more Yuna, our cat's eyes twinkling in darkness, spinning spears he is still too slow to catch. My Yuna, in daylight's glare, he names the sun as his asks it to come closer and opens wide to hug, to swallow, to hold its unfathomable glow. And in the water too, in any water, Yuna, Yuna, bath, puddle, lake, sea, ocean, rain, our faces and the light, a river, and in the window, any window, especially a stranger's, Yuna, this December morning, through smoking sky and a cobweb of trees, he finds it there, even as it fades. And in my pocket, I find it too. Yuna, an envelope of his first trimmed crescent hairs. So many fallen moons. Thank you, Julia, for uh, that wonderful poem. Thank you for your work. And thank you so much for talking with us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm excited to come back. I've been speaking with the poet Julia Kolchinsky Dasbach. She will give a virtual reading as a guest of the U of O's Creative Writing Program on January 26th, 2022. Thanks so much for watching.